there are different ways to get around town. You can drive, but that will cost you a bundle, and the center of London has a road tax known as a congestion charge. Taking a cab is another option, but that will also get very expensive very fast. By far, the best way to get around town is the underground. Started in 1863, the London Underground has grown to a vast network consisting of 268 stations with over 400 kilometers of track. The initial network consisted of railway lines constructed using the cut and cover method, which required digging up the street, laying the track underneath, and covering the whole thing up afterwards. The stations of these near-surface lines are rich in Victorian-era architecture, a period when the leaps in technological progress were just as dramatic as the technological leaps we now experience today. And after 145 years of use, the London Underground is more popular and essential than ever before. The London Underground is surprisingly clean. I've only seen one cup on the station platform and some graffiti just outside the station's boundaries. Unlike many subway networks of the world, there were no signs of chronic graffiti or window scratches anywhere to be found, which is a testament to the work done by the cleaning crews. The London Underground got its nickname, The Tube, from the shape of the deep bored tunnel lines which first opened in 1900. Unfortunately, it's doubtful anyone back then could have predicted how quickly London was about to grow. When combined with the lack of ventilation shafts, the deep tube lines can get so overcrowded during rush hour that temperatures can reach 45 degrees Celsius during the summer, making for a miserable riding experience. And then you have those friendly, encouraging messages from the platform and train staff. Mine are closing doors, thank you. The London Underground has a ridership of 1 billion passengers per year, or four and a quarter million passengers per day. But despite the heat, the lack of air, and the cramped quarters, all these commuters think about at the end of the day is to head to their homes in neighborhoods such as this one. We're at the Surrey Quays in the Rotherite district, site of the former Surrey docks originally established in 1700. Residential development of the area was initiated in the 1980s with the foundation of the London Docklands Development Corporation. It's a suburb like many other, but it doesn't feel like one. It's very different from the traditional British neighborhoods with their lines of connected houses, and nowhere near as sterile and as bleak as the nightmarish suburbs of North America. One reason for this is the area's strong Nordic heritage, which has influenced its layout, its roadways, and its architecture. Which probably explains why some of the homes look like they came straight out of an IKEA catalog. With its shopping center, local services, parks, small lakes, and wildlife, it's the perfect place for young couples and families alike. And yet, you're only 15 minutes away from the center of London by tube, so you're never entirely isolated from the rest of the city. To visit the area, take the Jubilee Line to the Canada Water Tube Station, take the shopping center exit, and follow the path along the Canada Water Basin. Turn left at the fake drawbridge and keep walking along the Albion Canal. Before you know it, you're there. But since we've already seen it, it's back on the Jubilee Line where we transfer to the Docklands Light Railway Line at Canning Town and get off at the next station at East India. Take the south stairs and head towards the wooden wall. Walk down this path to the river, then turn left and follow the path along the river, through the gates, across the locks, down this path, follow that guy down the street, towards Trinity Boy Wharf, past the totem utility pole and the lamp post wrapped in yellow danger tape, where we find London's only lighthouse. But we're not here for that. We're here for this. It's called Container City. 
And yes, it's a residential block constructed out of old shipping containers. Created by Urban Space Management Limited, Container City is a working example of a low-cost housing solution constructed out of disused shipping containers. Due to their standard sizes and strict tolerances, assembling one of these structures only takes a few days. The concept can be expanded to the construction of schools, businesses, workshops, and any other suitable project requiring a sheltered space. And because they remain shipping containers, it's very easy to disassemble and move the entire structure to a new location. Trinity Boy Wharf is also the home of many artists and artisans, offering a variety of works of art to suit all tastes. So why did I show you all two very different residential areas? I wanted to demonstrate the enormous flexibility of London's architecture. In a city over 2,000 years old, London's architecture is a fascinating mix of old and new structures alike. The city has always been at the forefront of urban architecture, more so after the destruction of a significant portion of the city during World War II. London has found just the right balance, successfully integrating its newer structures in the London of olden days. And despite its somewhat ridiculous living costs, I'd be more than happy to live here if given half the chance. Easy to get around, greatly improved food, small streets, shops and parks wherever you go, wonderful people, Londoners have many reasons to be proud of the fantastic city they've created over so many years. And it's not over yet, they're still at it, not only building new structures, but also bringing back to life old ones such as St. Pancras. Originally constructed in 1868 and rebuilt at a cost of 800 million pounds, St. Pancras International is now home to the Eurostar train service, offering connections via the Euro Tunnel to the rest of Europe, including the city of Paris, which is where I'm heading next. With its original steel support beams, glass roof, and vintage red brick walls, the station is half transportation hub and half architectural museum, which includes its own works of art, some of incredible size. And it's a good thing I had something to look at, because just over a week before my scheduled departure, another lorry caught fire in the Channel Tunnel, disrupting the entire service. Luckily, no one was seriously injured in that incident. And by the time my travel date approached, a reduced service had already been established. So now, all I was hoping for is that I could get to Paris at least on my originally scheduled travel day. Hmm, this might take a while. The train is supposed to leave at uh, uh, 1322. My original train was supposed to leave at 1404. So I'm actually going to leave early. Although I did show up at the train station at 8.30. <laughs> so it's a long wait. But the next thing you know, I was on board the train and we were heading to Paris. Our travel to the remaining open channel tunnel was a bit slow since we had to queue up behind other trains but we eventually reached the tunnel, finally crossing the English Channel from below. Twenty-five minutes later, we were in France and were soon heading to the city at top speed. In no time at all, we had arrived at the City of Lights, surprisingly, at my original arrival time. Not bad at all. Coming up, we're in Paris, where we'll visit the Louvre, the Tuileries Gardens, and a flea market. Get out your cash! 